uh, live on Facebook with us. We welcome you to our Sunday school uh, uh, moment that's going to start in about seven minutes. To give you all the opportunity to, uh, if you so choose, you can hit the share button on your uh, mobile or device or your laptop. Share the Sunday school experience with those on your timeline. We pray that in spite of everything that's been going on, that you've been having a great week and that the Lord has awakened you and blessed you to see another day. We are thankful and grateful. Uh, we are excited uh, about the opportunity to just live, move, and have our being in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I see you all coming in. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It is so wonderful. Keep on coming in. Keep on coming in. Come on in the room. Come on in the room. We want to make sure that everybody is part of this wonderful, timely uh, Sunday school lesson as we continue to teach on areas of justice in the churches, the believers' role and responsibility to execute justice, to stand for justice, and to pursue justice on behalf of the disenfranchised, those that are overlooked, the marginalized, the oppressed. And God is going to hold the church and the believer accountable for her actions as well as her inactions uh, when these types of situations arise. We are all in the midst of hotbed situations uh, with the protests that are happening even now as we speak all over the United States. And God still has a word for the church. Uh, I pray that those of you who are actively participating in the protest, that you would do it with a sense of godly dignity. Uh, we are not rioters. We are not wild. We are not untamed beasts. We are not animals. We are human beings simply seeking the same justice as the haves have. And until things are balanced, until there's equity across all nationalities and humans, uh, these types of situations are going to continue to happen. We are tired. We're frustrated. And understandably so. And you won't understand what we're in if you're not in our skin. And so we, we're, we're praying and uh, I'm praying for every preacher and every pastor who has the responsibility of preaching of the gospel. And uh, as I was re reminded once again, I'm praying that we keep our theology in front of our humanity because it's God's word that leads us. Uh, and I want you all to understand that it's okay to be angry. We should be angry, but scripture says, be angry, but say it not. We do not want to allow our emotions to put us in a position where we're out of the will of God. And so we uh, want to do things in a right and righteous manner uh, so that God will be pleased. Ultimately, that's who will judge us. Amen. And so uh, the idea is for not for us to be, um, for us to react, but for us to respond. And there's no greater way to respond than with the word of God in the spirit of God. I'm praying God's peace all over the cities that we've been called to minister in. It's uh, it's it's hot out there, and uh, but know that there are people who are praying for you, and praying for your safety, also praying for the safety of those police officers and sheriffs. They are human. They have families too, and um, the disrespect that has been witnessed on behalf of some of the protesters is appalling. Uh, you should not provoke. You don't have to throw bottles and, and break windows and vandalize you. That, that's not a protest. That, that's a riot. And uh, nowhere in scripture do I remember uh, Jesus or the people who represented him rioting in order to get their point across. And so do not misrepresent the faith. Do not misrepresent the church. And do not rep misrepresent the Christ trying to push a personal agenda and express anger and violence and hatred. You know, uh, if, if we're gonna stand against them, we cannot be like them. Amen. And so uh, we're, we're continuing to lift everyone up in prayer. We wanna welcome you again, those who are on the telephone conference call, those who are watching via Zoom. Yes, we thank Sister Bonnie. And happy birthday, Bonnie. 
uh, who celebrated the birthday yesterday, her and Sister Monica, who are operating the technical stuff behind the scenes. And, and uh, uh, we welcome you. We thank God for you, your presence and participation in today's Sunday School uh, uh, lesson. If you are joining us from out of town, put what city and state you're joining us from. We want to formally welcome you and, uh, and, and, and thank you for uh, choosing Partakers Church Baptist uh, to share in today's worship experience with. We thank God for you. We love you. We are praying for you. We are connecting generations to Jesus. Amen. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to go ahead and get started on our Sunday school lesson. Uh, let us look unto the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Woo! You are awesome. You are mighty. You are magnificent in all of your ways. You are great and greatly to be praised. We honor you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you up. We thank you for being our God, our guard, our gauge, and in these times, our guide. It is you whom we adore, who we worship, who we surrender our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto thee. And God, we would ask that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would create in us clean hearts, O oh God, renew a right spirit within us, that we can continue doing your holy and righteous will. Now, God, we need you to touch us. This nation, this world is in turmoil. There are many enemies that are coming against your people. God, with the COVID, with the prejudice, with the violence, with the racism, with the injustices that we are all facing even now, we need you by way of your Holy Spirit to intercede, to interfere, to intervene, and to interrupt uh, that your will may ultimately be done. Look upon your people and have mercy. Touch all of those who are in positions of power who make decisions concerning uh, the forward or backward movement of this nation. You know how to get to them when we can. And so, God, we recognize that you own the patent on vengeance. And though many hearts are disturbed and angered, God, we pray that you would arrest flesh, that it not glory in any way, shape, form, or fashion, but that your Holy Spirit will continue to rule and reign in righteousness. Now, teach us this lesson, God. We're ready to receive. Feed us till we want no more. Bless everyone who's here in the building with me. Those who are watching via Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube. God, thank you for using uh, uh, streams, multimedia options for the message uh, that ministers to the misery of the masses. We thank you for making these options available to us. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Return to Love and Justice is the title of our Sunday School lesson. And it's, it's, it, it's amazing that it's entitled because it is so timely. To suggest a return is to say that we've left it. And God is calling on us to return uh, to something that we've abandoned because we've allowed uh, our lust for power our ignorance of scripture, our disobedience, we've allowed sin to lead us off of God's path of righteousness. So he's calling for this entire nation uh, to return to love and justice. Our uh, background scripture is coming from Hosea uh, chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verses one and two, verses seven through 10, and then Hosea chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, then verses 6 through 14. Uh, I encourage each and every one of you that in your spare time that you would read each chapters 11 and 12 of the book of Hosea. Uh, and let me also add this real quick. Those of you who have not, we would encourage you all that if you haven't done it, that you would subscribe to our Partakers Church Baptist of Detroit YouTube channel and that you would prepare to, for the uh, congregational reading that's going to happen at the 10 o'clock hour by going on to our church website at www.partakerscb.org, clicking on the worship tab, and you can download the congregational reading, and as well as our Partakers One Accord uh, declaration 
And uh, so since we've got this Zoom connection and Bonnie's working it so well, we're going to be having uh, uh, announcements and other things forthcoming uh, using this great tool that God has given us. Amen. Our aim for change, our aim for change is that uh, by the end of the lesson, we will compare prosperity as a worldly goal with the godly virtues of love and justice. We will regret the occasions where we have made material prosperity a greedy, covetous goal, and then practice love and justice as key virtues. We welcome everyone again, those of you who are on the conference uh, uh, telephone call, conference line, we welcome you as well. Our in focus story, 16 year old twins, Brianna and Jackson and their family just wanted some warm food. Their father had lost his job and their mom was sick. They wanted to eat and would volunteer to clean up in exchange for food. The twins left their two bedroom apartment and their two siblings to find the family some food. They stopped at a church a few blocks away and asked if the church was still serving meals. The church said they were, but the kitchen closed in 20 minutes. Jackson ran back to tell everyone, but their mother was too weak to go inside. Their father stayed with her and told the other kids to go. The children thought they would ask, to, or the children thought they would ask to take the food for their parents. To their surprise, they were told they could not take extras. Brianna and Jackson managed to sneak bread and fruit in their pockets. The church's sign read, we are a caring church. Brianna said they sure don't represent the care of God too well. Maybe the church down the street with the broken sign that simply read, all our welcome might mean. Hmm. Have you ever met or experienced rejection from people who claim to love the Lord? How are churches and believers guilty of saying they love the Lord, but not always displaying their love in genuine and meaningful ways? This gives us something to think about. Because if you've been in church any length of time, you've encountered a representative who misrepresented the motives and the love and the charity, kindness, genuineness of God. Our keep in mind scripture comes from Hosea chapter 12, verse 6, and it reads, Therefore, turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. Our people, places, and times, the focus, the character, our focus is Hosea. We know Hosea, don't we? Amen. Hosea, one of the minor prophets, he was an Old Testament prophet of the 8th century B.C., called by God from the northern kingdom. He prophesied about the last 40 years before the fall of the northern kingdom, warning the Israelites to return to God before it was too late. He was an older contemporary of Isaiah and Micah and began his ministry at a time when Israel was prosperous and powerful under King Jeroboam II. It was from 790 to 749 BC. The background reads, the book of Hosea illustrates a time when the people of Israel had been unfaithful to God through worship. They sought out relationships with Assyria and Egypt that were not approved by God, all in pursuit of military gain and subjected themselves to improper worship of Baal. Throughout the story of Hosea, God has shown his commitment to the people of Israel, and yet they continue to both reject his love and disobey his commands. The northern kingdom managed only two centuries remaining vibrant and alive, in large part because its leaders failed to teach the people of Israel how to seek and follow after God. Let me just pause right there um, to encourage the preachers and to also warn in a sense that the goal is to ultimately lead people to Christ. Uh, there are some who uh, are passionate about protest and that's okay as you should be. We all are to a certain extent but the priority never forget that the priority is leading 
lost humanity to a living Christ. When we get off that path, when we allow ourselves to be distracted by the things that go on this, in this world, we are we can end up easily misleading people according to an emotion that's guaranteed to change after the fires have settled and after the spirits and emotions have calmed down. Our job is to lead people to God. Hosea predicted the downfall of Israel when Shalmaneser of Assyria conquered it and shortly after Judah went into captivity. In many ways, today's passages show how God is lamenting the frustration of a people who continue to defile the meaning of worship. In chapter 12, Jacob, who was later renamed Israel, practiced deceit and yet was the common ancestor of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, however diligent in his desire to see God, wrestled, good God Almighty, with the angel to receive his blessings. Jacob's ancestors named in this text remain under the belief that their benefits would be a direct result of their success without help from God. Jacob attempted to cleanse his home of idol worship. We see that in Genesis Chapter 35, verse 2. However, his descendants remained steadfast in their worshiping of idols. And as a result, this honesty, as noted by Jacob's past, became the norm in how people attain their wealth. Those of you who have families, those of you who are heads of households, those of you who have been called and ordained by God to lead, please know that your words and actions have a generational effect. Though you may change in the process, if you've already sown seeds of injustice and, 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 and wrongdoing and sin, it can affect generations coming after you. The decisions you make now will affect your children's children's children. And so God is calling on us in this critical time to make sure that every decision we consider every action that we take, that we first run it through the filter of scripture within its context to make sure that what we're saying and what we're doing is actually in God's will. There are four points in this lesson. The first one being Israel's deliverance. The second one being God's reaffirming love. The third one being the punishment of Israel. And the fourth, seeking God's love and justice. Number one, Israel's deliverance. We read that in Hosea chapter 11, verses one and two. It says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. The lesson teaches us on this morning that God has in many ways envisioned the relationship that he maintained with Israel as similar to that of a parent and a stubborn child. God help me. God reemphasizes the love he possesses for his children despite the many times that the children of Israel continuously disobeyed God even after being brought out of Egypt. We see that in these two verses. God continued, however, to restore the people of Israel. And in many ways, this sets up the narrative for the Messiah that would come and offer reconciliation and hope. The question is asked, what does the hope of a Messiah, what does the hope of Jesus offer to the future of a people of Israel? Well, I tell you one thing that it does, because his sacrifice alone atones for the sin of all humanity, for those who choose to accept him as Savior and Lord. But unfortunately, with the multitude of churches and educated preachers and theological seminaries that are blanketed all across this earth, sin is still at an all-time high. The church has influence, but not the influence that she should have according to God's design, because we can easily become distracted self-centered, self-absorbed, and selfish uh, uh, in our representation of Christ. And so we have to make sure uh, um, the things that played out during the children of Israel's time as in today's time, no matter how 
great the preacher preaches, how anointed they preach or how they teach, there are still going to be some, unfortunately, who do not get it. And then there are going to be some who do not want it. But our job is not to trace and track the progress of the word. Our job is to preach and teach the word and trust that when it's sent out, that it won't return void because that's what God's word says. It will accomplish what it was set out to accomplish, but it will be in God's time. The seed of God's word is only wasted on the soul that rejects it, that rejects it. And so we have a responsibility that even when the culture changes, even when there remains to be a number of people who will not receive the gospel, that does not exempt us from continuing to preach the gospel, to share the gospel. We will be judged, not just preachers and pastors, but if you are a born again believer, you have a responsibility and an obligation to tell somebody about Jesus. And I bet this, I don't even know some of you all that well, you watch it on Sunday. And you wonder, why is this black preacher getting ready to get in my business? Mm. I'll tell you why. Because there's probably some of you who's watching this who have relatives, who have children, who have co-workers. You have influence. You are saved. But yet, when it comes to sharing the gospel of Christ, you've been silenced. Mm. Just like some of the people who are silent during uh, this, this uh, open and blatant racism that's taking place around the country. Those who are in power but choose to be quiet. Mm -hmm. You will be judged. Those who can act, those who can uh, uh, create laws and vote on laws that will protect our interests are not doing it. And you will answer to God. America will answer to God. She will reap what she has sown. Amen. And so Israel's deliverance number two God's reaffirming love. I love Jesus. I love God because it seems no matter how many times we mess up, he still continues to extend the grace and the mercy. Every morning we receive a new mercy. And it is not based on what we've done. It's not based on who we are. It's not based on what we have. It's just based on him being such a loving and caring. And, and, and compassionate and saving and restoring God. He wants to see you win. Amen. Amen. Even when you fail, he wants to see you make it. Even when you fall, he wants you to get back up. Even when you get off the trail, he wants to put you back on track. He loves you. And, and of those we love, we cherish. And I like how he uses the example of a parent to a child because we have children and they mess up, but our love for them does not change. Just because they stray off the path does not make them any less our child. Amen. Amen. This is why we can stand next to them in court and we know they're guilty. This is why we can defend them and we know they're wrong because they are our children. There's a, there's the parental love that we extend towards our children that in some cases we know they're wrong, but because they're ours, we can't see no wrong in them. That's how God feels about you. That's how he feels about me. And so his love is expressed through the redemptive work of his son on the cross. Hallelujah. God's reaffirming love. In verses uh, 7 through 10, it reads, And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call them to the most high, None at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee an Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. Thank you, Jesus. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. God's reaffirming love. 
The lesson teaches us that God reminds the Israelites what happened to Adma and Zeboam, who both perished with Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet God refuses to allow that to happen to the people of Israel. God remains adamant in his refusal to destroy Israel by reaffirming, listen to this, love and not anger. Love is a powerful tool mm -hmm. when properly used. Amen. Amen. Love could do more fixing than anger could destroy it. And so we thank God for his great love for us, that love that covers a multitude of sins. And I know that there are times when we're in our flesh, when we witness and experience things that are happening like they are today. And the last thing we want to do is express love. Our desire, our flesh pushes us to express the anger and the frustration uh, that many of us are dealing with, but God is calling on us to love, and he knows it's difficult, but it's not impossible, because we have the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, of which uh, uh, an attribute of a fruit is love. And so we cannot say that it is not within us to express, because to do that is to cheapen the work of the Holy Spirit that we say is operating in us. There is love in you even in situations like this. And let's not misappropriate it because we've allowed anger to take the lead instead of love. Love suffers, yes. Love sacrifices, yes. And love serves. And unless we're meeting all three, we're not meeting any because it's all packaged within love, amen. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, have not love. I'm a sounding brass, tingling symbols. I'm talking loud, saying nothing. That's from the book of James Brown. Is hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it is his listen to this? It, he remains adamant in his refusal to destroy Israel by reaffirming love and not anger. Instead of God's wrath, which would have been justified, God states that his compassion is aroused. Hear this lesson, saints, especially those who are out protesting. His, his compassion was aroused, not his anger. You actually do in a case have to feel sorry for racist folk. Mm -hmm. Even if they try to use the Bible and Jesus as justification for their actions, you've got to in a sense, feel sorry that they really don't know him. Like those who love the Lord who knows, because if they knew him, if God, if they gave God by way of the Holy Spirit the room to operate within them, there's a love that would overwhelm them, that would compel them to do right. Just because it's right. Amen? God states that his compassion is aroused. This is a reminder to the people of Israel of God's divine position. We cannot, hear me, we cannot place our, our definitions of human characteristics onto how we understand God's behavior. God is infinitely larger than we could imagine. So when we note God's love, despite our disobedience, we cannot attempt to rationalize it with our human understanding. God believed in the return of faithful people, and he still does today. The question is asked, how do we come to understand God's divine love through his relationship with the people of Israel? If you look at him, just simply being God, it seems like he lets us get away with everything. We commit love to him one minute, then we walk away. We're we're, we're, we're obedient one moment, we're disobedient the next. But he, we're so inconsistent. But yet God remains consistent in every way. Hallelujah. And I thank God that he's consistent, even when I'm inconsistent. Because, his, because of his consistency, it prevents my inconsistencies from destroying me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, God. 
So we have not just God's reaffirming love for us, but then we have punishment because listen, if you're a good parent and your child gets out of order, some of y'all got this thing called act right. Amen. That you put on them. Not because you hate them. You don't just wake up one morning and arbitrarily decide you want to beat your children. <laughs> Even though some of them may feel that way because they had to endure those beat downs. But you discipline because you love. Whom the Lord loves, he chases, he chastises. And so when we do wrong, a just God is obligated to respond. So the punishment of Israel is noted here in chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it reads, Ephraim feedeth on the wind and followeth after the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried into Egypt. The Lord did also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, Will he recompense him? God is not going to punish you for something you didn't do. It's going to be according to your ways. Not according to your environment. Not according to your influence. But according to your ways. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven forgive their sins and heal their lands. There are ways that you may be okay with that I may be okay with, but we better make sure that God is okay with it. And if we find out, according to his word, that he's not okay, guess who has to change? Because his word isn't. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and this is a time and day where the believer needs to embrace fully the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At different times, Assyria and Egypt each conquered Israel and held their people captive. Yet Israel still tries to make alliances and trade deals with them. Good God Almighty, this can speak to me in so many ways. Because when God allows you to escape, when he sets you free from the place and the people that had you oppressed and in bondage, why would you even want to go back and do business with them? God does not make a complete disconnect for us to decide after the winds have calmed and after the dust has settled that we go back. Yeah. Uh, help me, God. Amen. He often allows us to be cut loose so that we can be loose. Amen. <laughs> Amen. There are some bridges he intentionally burns because he does not want us to go back across them. Amen. Ooh, I wish Lot's wife was here to say something about it. She would tell some of us that it's Maddie in some instances, it ain't even good to look back once he's freed you because you can end up salty. <laughs> Amen. He continues, Israel continues to use all forms of deceit and violence in pursuit of power. God, if that's not happening today, in many ways, these actions remain in direct conflict to the bondage that they were set free from as a people. Pursuit of their wishes and desires caused the people of Israel to fall. God at this moment is calling out Jacob and the people of Israel for their deceit and the deceit of his descendants who believe that their successes came from their works. God is now calling to bring a charge against the people of Israel. However, this charge is coming from his continued love for them. Amen. Amen. When you love, there's some things you've got to call out. We've got, we are people of truth, supposedly. We're to walk in truth and in love. The question is asked, do you think that it would have been better to have the people of Israel destroyed to understand the seriousness of their actions? Some may think so, some may think not. Because listen, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, this situation with uh, uh, 
uh, I, I know his name. I'm just, George. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just trying to not allow my emotions to take the lead. But this situation that happened to George Floyd stains. And looking at the video and now looking at all of these different videos from different angles only enrages me more. Mm -hmm. But if the police was my son, would I be as angry? See, we could want somebody to burn and go to hell based off of the impact their actions had on our emotions. But God doesn't deal. His decisions are made according to emotions. He, it is not his will that any man should perish, any man, but that all come to repentance. That means the racist, the bigot, the separatist, the nationalist. Yeah, he, he wanted, he, he, if, if Hitler had received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of his life, that person that historically is responsible for the death of so many Jews. It, it, if this nation would repent for how it's mistreated black folk and turn back to God, that, that's his will. And God has a way of orchestrating things to ensure that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you have to ask yourself, are the things that you're experiencing or taking part of on earth, is that something that you believe is happening in heaven? <laughs> is heaven setting fires, breaking into buildings and smashing glasses over the sin it sees in us every day? Are we being destroyed? Help me, God. And we're there are people, let me just go ahead and say this. There are people who are protesting against the sins committed by this government who are fornicators, who are liars, who are gay and lesbian, who are greedy, who are over consumers, who are sinning in every capacity. But yet, when the light is shined upon their sin, they want mercy. They justify. I'm just talking to biblical people. I'm not here to argue. If the Bible says it's sin, it's sin, and I'm agreeing with the Bible. But we have to think before we start uh, throwing pitchforks and shooting arrows and throwing spears and bullets at those that we have already labeled evil, we better make sure that our sin closet has been cleaned. Otherwise, we see them from a skewed view, meaning that the plank has to be removed from our eyes in order that we may remove the splinter from theirs. So, so don't just rush to judgment and send a person to hell uh, while being blind from the sins that we as individuals commit on a daily basis. If God would do to us what we desire to do to people who we feel have wronged us, would that be justice? I think not Not the God kind of justice. Number four, because I know y'all ready to get on with the worship. <laughs> seek God's love and justice. We see that in Hosea 2, verses 16. I'm sorry, Hosea 12, verses 6 through 14. Therefore, Turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. He is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He love to oppress. And Ephraim said, yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. In all my labors, they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Of course, we're not going to see ourselves as sin. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. 
I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of thy prophets. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. They sacrifice bullocks in Gilgal. Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife. And for a wife, he kept sheep. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. Good God Almighty. God seeking love and justice. We ain't getting away with nothing. God urges the people of Israel once again to return to the ways of love and justice. They must put away the deceit and harm they have displayed since their release from Egypt. The boasting of riches and wealth is not rooted in justice or love, nor does it carry weight in God's kingdom. God reminds the Israelites of the festival of booths, a time when they spend a week living in tents to honor God's protection when they wandered the wilderness for 40 years. However, God warns the people of Israel that if they continue to live in such a way that glorifies material success and idol worship, they would be sent back to the tents and placed in bondage. Question is asked, how can one attain wealth in a way that is still affirming of God's love and justice? <laughs> how can you gain wealth without compromising your integrity, without going outside the boundaries of our faith? God has a way. He, scripture reminds us that he gives us the power to get wealth. But how we use that power will determine if it's him doing it, or if it's the devil doing it, or if it's us doing it. I'd rather go God's way. Amen. The liberating lesson reads, uh, well, let me do this, discuss the meaning real quick. It says, note the times in your life where you found yourself disobeying God and idolizing other things. How did God extend his love and mercy towards you even at that time? How do you understand success in any area of your life as it relates to your relationship with God? Do you find yourself seeking love and justice even if the people and communities you loved initially reject you? The liberating lesson reads, there are individuals and corporations in this country who continue to profit from deceit and improper business practices. These individuals and corporations find themselves hoping to obtain worldly wealth and prosperity. Meanwhile, they continue to widen the wealth gap globally. Their desire to achieve power, status, and wealth by human means has allowed them to lose sight of the destruction that they are causing to work to working class and poor people. In many ways, God is still calling out to them both in love and strong rebuke. God desires all his children, even those that operate in deceit and material wealth, to bring justice and restore good order. We can often find ourselves seeking to obtain the material wealth of millionaires, meanwhile forgetting the reason God blesses us with wealth in the first place. We have been given wealth so that we may extend back to the same love, or extend back the same love God has shown us, and share it among the least of these and work towards restorative economic justice. I'm reminded of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. How Lazarus sick, sores all over his body. The only thing he had to comfort was the saliva from the tongues of dogs to keep him comfort. And when he reached to the rich man uh, to have a need met, he was ignored. They both died. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man, the Bible says from hell, he lifted up his eyes. Be careful how you treat people in this earth because there's a life that's happening after this where God flips the script 
And now the beggar is the one who has what the former needed. <laughs> when on earth, when the beggar approached him, he didn't meet the need. And I believe God is turning those tables even now. That those whose only goal have been to get rich and die try without consideration of using their wealth to help those who are least overlooked, left out. God is not pleased. He does not give us, allow us to accumulate so that we may build bigger bars, but that we be used as a vessel, as a distribution center to help others. And I believe the longer we distribute, the more he pours. And so nobody would ever be without. Application for activation. It reminds us to always seek God daily in every aspect of your life. Ensure that you are keeping God at the head of your life. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first. Anybody knows what that word first means? Seek ye first, initially, from the get-go, from the jump off. The number one priority, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his ways, his will, according to his word. And everything that you're chasing to get rich, God will assign to chase you. But you got to put him first. Ask yourself, what are you faithful to? That's a powerful question to consider. Even in times like this, what do you find yourself idolizing? You can also examine if the blessings that God has provided you should be redistributed or re redistributed to those around you in need. Lastly, seek to trust God to continue being a provider in your life and not to trust in your own ability to provide. Mm -hmm. Challenge question goes out to those as we're in this temperate time. Before you decide to go out and protest and picket, did you consult God? Did you earnestly pray and ask God, what is my role as an individual in all of this? What do I tell the people that you've assigned uh, uh, to my stewardship about the current events that are taking place. Because there are those out there, unfortunately, they just want attention. Uh, they, they just want to feel important. Uh, there's no really, there's no care or concern for the, uh, the daily uh, acts that take place against our people. It, it amazes me that with the amount of death amount of corruption, the amount of killing that takes place daily in our communities, we only wait on the big story before we get in front of cameras and on media talking about justice. It's not something that we seek just for the big opportunities, but maybe if we start addressing them at the ground level and be consistent and not just wait for opportunities to grandstand on quicksand, then we could actually come up with a strategy that will make change in this country. Listen, you can protest, you can pick it, and that's a good thing. But until you get a, a seat at the table, one of the blessings of, uh, of the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is that his protest led to a seat at the table he was able to meet with the decision makers. What is your goal? He didn't have to, he used nonviolent for that. He was criticized. And so I'm amazed at how many people are using his name now who couldn't stand him when he was living. And so let's make sure that we're praying and seeking God before we take action. If you seek him first and if you're open to his instruction, I'm sure he would guide you on the right path. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Amen? Amen. Did the lesson bless anybody? If it blessed you, put in, the, put in the comment section, this lesson blessed me. Amen. If you're on the teleconference call, just holler out and bless me. And uh, we thank and praise God for your participation. We ask that if the Lord has moved upon you to sow a seed into this ministry or to give to this church, there are three, three ways you can do it. First of all, you can log on to our church's website at www.partakerscd.org. 
And then in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a donate button. You click on that donate button, it'll take you to two options, Givelify. You can look at Givelify of the Partakers Church Baptist, or you can give via Zelle at pcb.trustee at gmail.com. Again, for Zelle, pcb.trustee at gmail.com. Or you can mail it to 2550 South Lindisdale Street, Detroit, Michigan, 48217. Listen, if we've got any visitors from out of town, we welcome you. We thank and praise God for you participating in our Sunday school hour. We would ask if you have any questions or comments or if you want to be safe. Amen. You can go to our, you can email us at partakerschurch at outlook.com. And to give us, uh, uh, you know, say hello, give a shout out, uh, talk about how the lessons have been blessing you. If you want to be saved, if you want to be part of this church, if you want to be saved, as a matter of fact, you can repeat these words from the sincerity of your heart. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I believe your son Jesus died, was buried, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And because I believe in my heart what I have just confessed with my mouth, I thank you, Lord, that I am saved. Thank you for saving me from this world, from myself, and from an eternity in hell. I give my life to you this day, and I thank you for receiving me into the family of faith. If you prayed that prayer, we would encourage you as soon as possible. Because we've gone global, because we're online, because we are not being allowed at this time to gather in the physical building, if you are without a church home, you can make Partakers your church home. Simply type in, I want to be a member of Partakers, and we will get back to you. And we will welcome you in with the love of Jesus Christ so that you can grow with us in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Let us close out in prayer, and then join us at 10 o'clock. That's in about how many minutes? In 15 minutes. 15 minutes, Dougie Fresh, you're on. And uh, we will begin our Sunday morning worship experience. And we pray that you will come back and join us. So we'll take, get ready to take a break. Go to the bathroom, eat you a quick snack, and come join us in 15 minutes. God, our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you, we praise you, we bless your holy and most righteous name. Thank you, God, for covering us and keeping us and walking and talking with us and reminding us through your word the seriousness and the need for love and justice to rule in the earth. Thank you for using us as vehicles, God, to promote your agenda and not our own. And God, if we failed in any way in not doing as you've given us instruction to do, forgive us once again and set us on the right path. That others may be impacted by our walk, that they may see our good works as we let our light so shine. But they would glorify the Father in heaven. Now, God, we pray that you would bless the gifts that have been given you take these gifts and multiply these gifts and that they be used for your kingdom and to your glory. And over and above the amount, bless the heart of the giver is our prayer. And these and all things we ask. As you be with us in the second, uh, the second round of worship, overwhelm us with your love. Saturate this place with your glory. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may do your will. We ask it all as we pray uh, for the those who are hurting, those who are helpless, those who are hopeless. We lift up everyone, God. Those on our partakers' prayer list whose names we will read out in worship and those whose names on the hearts and minds of the people participating in this Sunday School Hour. Reach them where they are, heal them where they are, touch them where they are, save them where they are, deliver them right where they are. We'll be mindful to always give your name the praise, honor, and glory it deserves us. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Let every heart say amen. Amen. amen and amen. We will be back in 13 minutes. We thank and praise God for you joining us. And remember, partake us forever. forever. God bless you. See you in a minute. Bye-bye, y'all.